So, um, so thank you very much for that. Um, we we uh, we have a number of slides we'd like to share. Dr. Johnson, why don't you introduce, say a little bit more about your work? Um, um, hello, I'm Dr. Johnson, um, and I am associate professor and director of writing at the University of Miami. Um, and a lot of my work involves working with undergraduates teaching uh, writing classes, but some of my work too involves working on the RCR curriculum. Um, I teach a research ethics course for the uh, CTS CTSA. Um, and part of that curriculum involves um, work with writing and the responsible conduct of research in relation to effective writing. And some of that we're going to talk about very briefly today. So that's what right, I and do. I'm a philosopher who, who directs our Bioethics Institute and collaborates with Dr. Johnson on a bunch of projects where we have tried over the years to to take an RCR curriculum that, in my opinion, this is self-criticism, had become boring, turgid, sclerosed, and more about compliance than about stimulating scientists to think creatively about research integrity. Uh, and so, if you will, I'm going to see if it all, all goes well here with the screen I'm intending to share. Uh, uh, but in the meantime, the, the idea is this, we, we have, I became disappointed in my own pedagogy around this, uh, that, that we, have, we have requirements for the responsible conduct of research, not because the people of the United States through their government or our institutions were thinking about how to make science better and said, you know, let's teach more ethics to scientists. It's because people did bad things. And uh, bear with me just a moment, the slides. And what we've decided to do was to take this history, which began with misconduct, for example, the David Baltimore case, fears that if taxpayers are paying for science that is not, that is, does not embody the, uh, or the best virtues related to, to uh, veracity, then they would be less inclined to want their taxes to be used for it. That led, as you know, to federal government RCR training rules. Actually, the government doesn't always call it training. We, we do, in many of our institutions, call it training despite the fact that some of us chafe against the word training when it comes to educating humans, um, and had a debate. Should the government tell scientists how to do this, or can scientists take care of their own business? And the science community sort of won, uh, and you have a compromise rule. RCR is mandatory, but there's flexibility regarding the content. And you may, of course, heard of the NIH-9, uh, not the Chicago 7, or for that matter, for those of you in Gainesville, the Gainesville 8. I don't know if anyone remembers the Gainesville 8 trial, but that's another story. And here are the nine requirements that the NIH is not insistent on. They say usually programs include all of these. They're not conceptually well thought out. Some things go together, some don't. Uh, and it's time, I think, since uh, in, in more than a decade since this was, was revised to go through it again. Uh, what the NIH had to do at one point was say that if you do all of this online, you're not doing a very good job. And if you do it once and never again in a research career, then you have failed. And if you only have one person do it and stand up for eight hours in front of your students, that's probably not adequate to the task. Um, and so we've actually had to, to modify a little bit our requirements. What we did in some cases, and I don't know that I'm responsible for this, but I'll take some responsibility. We came up with RCR Light. How many of our institutions have a committed budget, committed faculty, committed resources for the responsible conduct of research? Well, we generally don't. I've been doing a survey and, a, uh, and we found that most places are sort of winging it. Uh, they've got 0 0.1, 0 0.2, uh, maybe of an FTE, but nowhere near 1.0 of an FTE. We don't do a very good job with faculty participation. We don't do a very good job with the duration. And in terms of frequency, we very often have an RCR program and try and muddle through for the rest of it. Our, our thesis, based on, on Joanna's work in, in writing about science, and she works with a lot of scientists and helps with their writing uh, challenges, and I, as a philosopher who is interested in research ethics in itself, basically think that that de minimis approach uh, is, is, is an opportunity for improvement. That compliance culture is ultimately ineffective, and I would suggest even deceptive, better. Let's think creatively about responsible conduct of research curriculum, especially regarding rigor and reproducibility. So the NIH 9 do not include rigor and reproduce, reproducibility. Those were added over the last couple of years when it became clear that we had yet another crisis. It wasn't a crisis of public trust because scientists might be fabricating, falsifying, plagiarizing data 
or doing research under extraordinary conflicts of interest. It was that we were spending a lot of money on science that was not producing reproducible results, which meant we didn't know what we discovered, when in fact the goal of discovery science is actually to discover something. Um, what Joanna and I have been doing then for the last for the last couple of years is trying to 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 make our RCR program a little bit more engaging, which we believe will improve science itself. That's a grand hypothesis, and uh, and uh, perhaps perhaps those of you watching will think this is an interesting testable hypothesis. Um, but what that includes is Joanna, who's going to take over in a second, uh, who actually talks about how writing prose can affect reproducibility. Joanna, the floor is yours. Um, so what Ken has just talked about is just is is an overall. Um, can you all hear me? OK, I had a lot of echo earlier, so I put my um, headphones in. I'm hoping that's better. If someone could just indicate to me that. that OK, good. Um, thank you. So. Um, so what I do, as I mentioned earlier, is I, I work with the RCR curriculum and specifically what we've done in, is introduce into the RCR curriculum these two components um, that are not typically there. There, there are the, um, uh, the, um, the mandated ones, the, the NIH9, but we have also... Um, included um, components that include writing prose and writing code. And I think Ken will talk a little bit about the writing code part of it as well. But the writing prose specifically, um, you know, it's not just about the, the authorship and the plagiarism, um, although, of course, that's that's part of it. But more specifically, um, really getting students um, to and researchers, sorry, to really think about the ways in which they are communicating their science um, and the extent to which effective and accurate communication plays into um, uh, questions of reproducibility um, and the ways in which um, we can, you know, if, if, if we don't write something accurately in, to the extent that somebody can reproduce the, the, the experiment. Um, so some of the ways in which, just very briefly, some of the ways in which we, um, Ken, if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide down to the um, penultimate, I think it's all the, the, the last slide, I think it was. Um, some of the ways in which right now I just have it on the the first slide that shouldn't be the case uh i apologize wrong look um so some of the ways in which that the um that we we that's it thank you very much for instance so so the the pros there um on the left hand side that left hand that left hand column so some of the things we work with with our researchers are thinking about the ways in which language is vague um opaque language hedging and boasting you know and a lot of i mean those of you who who were at the um at the the keynote uh, talk earlier today, um, you know, and a lot of the things that we've been talking about um, in our own breakout sessions and, and conversations, obviously, are the ways in which, you know, there are these tensions, these very problematic tensions, and to do with, you know, you really need to sell your study, you need to boast, um, but in fact, you know, using boastful words, things that are innovative, um, novel, those kinds of things are actually problematic because they're not always true. Um, so that can be a problem, excessive use of, of passive voice, um, excessive use of, of, of positive words. And, and studies have been done over the last, um, or one study examined certain terms that were used in, in, in a PubMed search over the last 40 years and terms like novel, innovative, um, I think significant, I can't remember off the top of my head, but several of those words that, that many of us use in our grant applications um, and to sort of promote the, the work that we're doing have increased, um, have had an, an increase of 15,000% over the last 40 years. So the ways in which we are, um, you know, that tension that we're experiencing because we do want to sell our study and we do want to make it, um, you know, to get funding for it means that we have to market it and we're using language that actually um, in the end isn't, isn't effective and is not, um, and is, is, is not um, communicating the, the, the research that we're actually doing. Um, uh, so I want to, we've just got a few minutes left, I want to just pass uh, pass back to, to Ken so that he can talk very quickly about um, similar um, similar concerns that we have um, that we that we are addressing in terms of um, writing computer code as well. Super, thank you for that. So, right, so well, it's an interesting tag team that we do. We've actually partnered not just in our RCR program, but some of you may be familiar with the software carpentry. Uh, it's an international organization that, that trains that trains science students and sciences, both in the, in the, in the, in the physical sciences and social sciences, how to write code and how to modify code. For example, uh, you, you are probably, if you're a scientist, doing something or other in anything from SPSS to R or Python, 
And that means you're borrowing code, you're modifying code, you're trying to adjust it to your purpose. And standard issues in software engineering ethics struck us as, as well, as an interesting part of our hypothesis that writing code and writing prose affect reproducibility. Uh, Joanna's giving examples of, of writing prose. Um, the, the other part of the hypothesis is that when your code is actually not very good or fit for purpose, was designed for something else, and you did a few minimal, uh, minimal hacks to make it for the new project, that may actually be the sort of thing that would prevent your study from being reproduced. What's the provenance? Where did you get your code from? And was it well documented? Uh, documentation ends up being really crucial, along with annotation. How did you keep track of what you did? And is it transparent and comprehensive? Or is it sloppy and hard to make sense of? Um, we, we, we are all saluting, signaling our, our, our love of transparency, uh, although uh, it's, it's a challenge to do so when, one, you're afraid someone might see your mistakes, or B, you think you've discovered some fabulous intellectual property uh, and that, that will, that will uh, ease, ease your way into retirement. Transparency ends up still being a moral obligation for scientists, uh, and we don't do as good a job as we can. Problem, not just for data and, and biomedicine, for example, but also when it comes to computer code, uh, that our curation practices are not always, um, well, one, not always transparent, two, not always very effective. Sometimes they're, they, they themselves uh, have process issues that need to uh, that need to be addressed. We're discovering, I, I think, in some sense, that the problem we're finding out now with using information technology for COVID uh, uh, resource allocation is, in some sense, a curation problem. When people talk about machine learning data sets as being biased. That is a meta curation problem. Someone allowed a buggy database that is ridden with missingness, if you're a statistician, to actually be used for something maybe a training set for a machine learning algorithm, or it may be a relational database if you don't even care about, about artificial intelligence. And there's also version control, which, which uh, we have come to believe can uh, contribute to uh, failures of reproducibility. What we've done, uh, and I'm gonna try and stop sharing now, um, there's a, 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 is, is I think it's a provocative hypothesis. Uh, Joanna actually received a double AMC award for it a few years ago. Namely, that the, the reasons for failures of reproducibility are numerous. These have not been identified before, and we're trying to, to advance the idea that they might be. Our larger project is that, that it, it enlivens an R, uh, RCR program when you do this, and it provides an opportunity to improve science at your institution. I, I'm happy to take questions if anybody's got any questions. We're trying to stay on time. We are, but we do have a question, and we do have a little bit of time left, so thank you both. Um, are you teaching a standard set of content across all subject areas, or does it vary depending on discipline? That's a really good question. Um, Ken, do you want to answer that? No, it was, it's too hard for me. Why don't you answer it? <laughs> well, let me, let me just first, in terms of RCR, we, we, for all of our cohorts, we talk on, on uh, we, we try to include the NIH 9, assuming they're in the biosciences. Sometimes I'll have a physics student wander by, and we don't spend a lot of time on human subjects and animals with them. Um, so in, so in, at granularity, we try and include the, the NIH 9 for people in biosciences, both, both uh, physical and social. Uh, but we will try and customize the example. So for example, you don't want to use, there, there Examples of misconduct in cell biology are going to be different, perhaps, than those in psychology, or different than those in in um, in marine geology. We have a marine campus as well, so we try and customize it to the extent possible. The beauty of software carpentry, by the way, is you'll have rooms full. It's like the RCR course, though. They'll have a mix of students from the physical sciences, the biological sciences, the social sciences, but they're all learning how to write Python code. And that's kind of interesting that, that, that it's, it, it reminds people the tools of science don't change just because you change the topic, the, the, the rules, including the rules that govern reproducibility, and for that matter, research ethics, I think remain and ought to remain pretty constant across the sciences, which is why we see variations in publication and authorship practices between and among sciences. You say, well, that's an interesting hack that you all came up with to get your, to get your names on papers. Great. Well, thank you. I know there are there are some questions that are still coming through, uh, but we're going to have to go ahead to the next talk. Um, if you uh, do still want to chat with uh, Joanna and Kenneth, uh, if you pull up your private chat menu, 
you can ask them where they are and go find a table <laughs> somewhere to set that up. Sure, happy to do that. And let me just quickly answer Mary, the ones who will do it. <laughs> but I'm happy to talk to you more individually. Well, thank you very much.